who plays lots of video games? Good, okay, that's most of, my, that's most of my audience, fair enough. Uh, has anybody played fragments of him? Oh, one person, okay, good. Um, okay, that's interesting. Always just curious, to be honest. Uh, so, hello everybody, uh, my name is Dr. Matter Haggis Burridge. I um, used to work as a games designer for Electronic Arts. Uh, I worked for Rebellion on Aliens vs. Predator, where I became the lead designer on the Marine campaign. Uh, which some people call the good bits. Um, I used to do freelance work. I ran my own indie company for seven years doing work for people like MTV2, uh, Channel 4, Flex Tech, Water Aid, a bunch of other people. Uh, most recently, I worked on Fragments of Him with Sassy Bots, which I'll be talking about quite a bit during this talk. Uh, I am mostly employed as a, the professor of creative and entertainment video games at NHTV University, which is changing its name in September to Brady University of Applied Sciences. So we're down in the south of the Netherlands, about an hour away by train from here. Uh, it's a very good academy for learning about games. Uh, I also have my own business, which is Copperstone C, where I do consultancy on video game design, interaction design, storytelling, branding, things like that. Um, I'm working on a new game at the moment, which is unannounced. I'm not gonna tell you anything more than that. Yay. Uh, I, this talk is going to be quite fast because I've got a hell of a lot to say in the next 38 minutes. Uh, and so I will be going fast, but the major points are going to be on the screen beside me, so hopefully you'll be able to see that. During this talk, I'm going to be building up a, a sort of a, a slideshow of five different summary sheets of the information. So if you're the kind of person who likes taking photos, all those summary sheets will be repeated at the end so you could see them and take a photo or whatever. So you don't need to be clicking as the whole thing goes, if you're that kind of person. Don't have to. Now, to me, interaction design is about a lot more than hard and GUI and menus and things like that. And that's the subject of this talk, it's interaction design. How do we make this work? Um, to me, it's the whole game. Interaction design is basically how you get from your, your game idea, your unique experience you want your player to have, through to the player. This is the way that we talk to our players. So it's everything from the, the shape of the table, the, the shape of the bottle. This is interaction design. This is a nice holdable size. It looks holdable. That is interaction design too. So it's not just buttons and menus and things like that. Because hopefully if we get our interaction design right, the art, the audio, the mechanics, then the player gets this great unique experience. That's the goal of what we're trying to get here. Our players are happy, the team's happy, the developers are happy. Everybody has a good time with this. Hello. So narrative design is also a bit like this. It's about much more than script writing. Some people go, I want to be a, I want to be a narrative designer. I kind of go, so you want to do all this other stuff? I go, I just want to write the stories. I go, that's not what narrative design is. So there's a lot of ambiguity about what this term really, really means. Part of it is interaction design. Part of it is choosing how the player gets through. And I'll be giving you practical examples of this later on. But I want to talk more about what narrative design is. So narrative design, one of the jobs we do is we build the narrative setting. This is otherwise known as the world, the world that the whole story happens in. The world of kind of uncharted is exploration and mysteries and, and all these kind of adventurous things. Um, we also have the story, the story that is set in that world, kind of what changes in the world from the beginning in chronological order to the end in chronological order, what has changed? That is your story. That is not quite the same thing as the plot. Now, the plot is actually how the story events are organized and paced to shape the audience experience. Now, a lot of the time, that will be the same as the story. You start with John McClane going to Nakatomi Plaza, and you end at the same time as John McClane walks out of Nakatomi Plaza. It's the same kind of uh, order. However, if you look at a film like Memento, the plot is in reverse of the story. So the plot and the story can be different things. So it's, it's quite easy, you'll hear these words used interchangeably quite often. I like to have definitions of them. Of course, you also build the characters. So the external and internal motivations, they have to fit the world, they have to fit the story, they have to fit the plot. So what do we mean by this? Well, um, if you were doing The Handmaiden's Tale as your world, having Lara Croft in there wouldn't fit. She's not a character that fits with that world. You need to have motivations and internal progression and characters that fit with the motivations of the world they come from. And they push against that or they move alongside it. There are different ways of making sure those characters fit there. So it has to fit that kind of social and historical background of the world. Otherwise, your character doesn't align with it all. And of course, you have the storytelling. 
that's all, that's all the stuff you do on paper in some ways. The storytelling is how it meets the player, how the audience e experiences and comprehends these features. And you've got a few different tools you can do this with, dialogue and performance, of course. You've got the visuals, how the story looks. You've got the audio, how it sounds. You've got the haptic feedback, like, which is rumble in the pad, the like, shaking things, or uh, is your smartphone rumbling or something like that. Or, then to a very large extent, you can sometimes have like 3D arcade cabinets, which are literally throwing you around. That's haptic feedback. Haptic feedback is anything you feel. Choice and interaction, of course. You know, people think of branching storylines. That's a form of choice. But it could be, I'm going to kill all of these people and not kill these people. It could be, I'm going to go down the, the dark path rather than the light path. These are all things that could be shaping the story. I'm going to, I'm going to tell the people in The Walking Dead that I am the father of this child, even though I'm not really. That is a choice the story may remember. And of course, context, what you do this in. You know, a person running naked through a forest is very different from a character running naked through a city. The context in which those actions and choices and visuals happen makes a difference to the meaning of that. You may notice that, well, actually, obviously, all of these things have to work in collaboration. These all have to sync up together and hopefully will form a common holistic view, which is the goal here. You may notice that the only part that is actually script writing is that little bit up there. That is the script writing bit. Now, when people say, I want to write stories for games, often what they mean is, I want to write the script. They don't want to do all the hard work of preparation and all the hard work of making the player understand what that preparation put in place. That is what a narrative designer can do for your team if given the full ability. That's a different speech's worth of content. I will show this at the end if you're interested, but these are certain things about how to use these things correctly. Uh, if you want to take a photo of that or anything later on, I will show that to you again. But those are the tools that we've got to tell our stories with. These form our interaction with players. They convey this foundation narrative experience. Uh, and as I've kind of talked about, putting in narrative experience first is what we're kind of going on here. But what does it mean to have a foundation narrative experience? What does it mean to put that narrative first in a video game experience? So a lot of games are made with using what I call the wall of fun. The wall of fun has, a, has its basis a brick which is unique mechanics. The interface and interaction design fits those unique mechanics. They're trying to find a new thing. That might be double jumping. That might be melee combat against super tough enemies. It might be um, running from left to right and jumping on the top of turtles. You know, what, what, is, what, is, what is the unique mechanic that, that makes your game feel special? Recharging shields or whatever. And often that is given the utmost importance. That is the most important thing about building your video game. And your whole game is based on trying to make something feel new. And of course, then you have technical abilities about this. The mechanics must function optimally. Because the mechanics are the first priority, everything else must make those mechanics work properly for you. And then the visuals are very important. The visuals kind of, they, they convey the gameplay mechanics to the player. They must preferably be visually appealing because that's part of the marketing for the game. It's how you sell things if it looks nice tends to make a big difference in your sales. And on top of that, you then try to do it as well as possible. You do it to the best of your abilities, the best of your resources, and that's basically how we make video games. Oh yeah, audio. Yeah, yeah, we better do some audio as well, hadn't we? Yeah, yeah, let's just hang it off the side there. Yeah, yeah, we need a sound person. Yeah, 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 of course. Oh, and narr narrative, yes. Story, we need a story. Does anyone know how to write a story? We can just put one in there. Doesn't matter who writes. This is quite often, does anyone on the team want to make up something? I have literally heard that said in studios. This is not putting a narrative experience as a foundation. That's not how you do it. So that, I'd say, the traditional wall of fun. And this is, this is kind of how we make video games. And this has worked pretty damn well for us. Uh, we've been making video games for about 43 years now in a commercial sense. Pong was 19, oh, 44 years. Uh, I think it was 1977 Pong came out in the arcades. That was the first time that a public could pay money to pay, play a game. So we're, games are almost as old as I am. Um, most likely older than I am. <laughs> How old am I? I don't know anymore. Um, and it works well. This is a good foundation for, for how we do things. This, this can make brilliant games. I'm not criticizing this as a bad tool. I'm just saying maybe there's other things we can do. So what happens if we find that there's this problem with finding unique mechanics? What happens if they become harder to find? And I don't know about you, but I've seen a few times in the last 10 years of video games where you kind of go, ah, another World War II shooter, eh? Hmm. Oh, we've now gone to futuristic sci-fi shooter. Okay. 
What else are we doing? Oh, we're now doing double jumps, are we? Titanfall, Destiny, uh, and a few others that came out that year. Hunting with bows and arrows, Tomb Raider, Far Cry. Uh, you know, it, it, that we, we have these little, tiny little micro trends, but it feels like finding something genuinely unique is becoming harder and harder. And how many new genres have come out in the last 10 years? A few. MOBA. Uh, Battle Royale, kind of. Uh, ish, yeah. It's, it's, finding, it's becoming harder and harder, I think, to find these unique mechanics. So, is this the only way to build our games? Is this the only way that we could go about doing this? What happens if we actually put the unique narrative experience as the basis, as that foundation brick of our wall here? And we give that the most utmost importance. Well, what do we do next? Well, um, if we're going to tr try to create something original, unique, in terms of the world, the story, the plot, the cast, or the characters, each of those are an element that innovation could come through. This is what television does. Television often does, it's a police cop, but in their spare time, they're an oil painter, and their oil painting skills help them solve crime. And, and you know, that, that if that hasn't been done yet, it probably will do, because we, we know that actually, genuinely, we could probably make that fucking work. You know we could. Uh, he's a magician, and he's consulting for the police. Yeah, well, that's actually about three or four different series now. It sounded ridiculous at the time, and then you go, like, oh, actually, no, that works. We can keep on telling stories just by mixing and matching a few of these things. So what do we do then? What do we do then? Uh, and, and after that, well, visuals. Visuals must support that narrative design as, a narr as much as possible to tell that story in as many ways as we can. Then I think audio is crucially important here. This is not something to leave off to the end. You can tell so much of your story with a sound effect. I'll give you some more examples of that later. That's the script, that's the sound effects, that's Foley. Foley is like natural sounds. So when I put this down here, that naturally happens. But in a video game, someone has to sync up that sound to happen. Otherwise, it's just like, huh. <laughs> the world doesn't feel right. So getting that sound right makes the world feel right. Uh, music, of course. Highly emotive, it's very instinctively processed. It's processed faster than visuals. Uh, audio gets to the brain faster than visual information gets to the brain. It's incredibly intuitive for us. And of course, you do this as well as you can. It's due to the best of your abilities, the best of your resources, you do this as best as you can. Uh, now, the interface and interaction design, yeah, it has to be good, solid mechanics. You don't necessarily need to innovate here to tell a good story. We've got so many tools to tell stories with. It's like kind of going, yeah, let's tell a new story, and let's reinvent the camera before we film this. No, no, we've got a lot of things we can tell stories with. We've got a lot of things we can make already. So how about we just use those and explore what we've already got, rather than always trying to innovate? So perhaps that sometimes might come a little bit to the end there. Usually it's finding new twists on those, but a little bit to the end. Um, so uh, they, they support and hopefully never inhibit the narrative. Of course, we need to have technical stuff working. Technically, innovation is probably going to be lower pressure than in a mechanics-driven game. Technical innovation in narrative, it's not necessarily doing that. It might work, it might not. So I think this is development putting the narrative experience first. This is, this is the kind of choices and the way that you would rearrange your, your priorities when you're developing if that narrative was it. It's, it, it, it's focused on experience as entertainment. And what do I mean by that? Well, typically when we make games, we focus on fun. Fun is a big word you hear in the games industry. And that can mean many things. That can be power or fear or fantasy. It could be sex. It might be love. Generally not love in video games, but hopefully more so in the future. Uh, social play, control, dominance, or, you know, there's all kinds of things that fun could be. And some people will find some of those things fun. Some of them won't find those things fun different things, but there's usually a version of fun in most video games. Whereas entertainment is something a little bit bigger, a little bit wider, and you get things like reconciliation, struggle, tragedy, emotions, grief, definitely love. Love definitely falls into this one, and it might be there. Love might be fun, but sometimes it's considered too heavy an emotion to be fun. Which is interesting, because games tend to stick into that fun box. But what what goes there? Well, what do, we, what do we call this box over here? Well, if we were to put this in film terms, well, maybe we've got the Avengers over here in the fun thing. You walk out of the cinema going, God, that was fun. And then maybe we've got Schindler's List. If you walked out of the cinema going, oh, that was fun. Mm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, let's talk about that. Um, 
I'd call that stories. That's, that stories can get all of this stuff. This is all story. It could be. Um, I think that's a powerful thing. And Schindler's List, don't forget, is an entertainment product. That is absolutely an entertainment that is outside of the, that comes from the studio system. It's from Hollywood. It's got major director. It's got major actors. This is an entertainment product, but it's definitely not fun because it's a good story. So I think we kind of get this, these narrative experiences. And since we're talking about games, we're going to call them playable interactive narrative experiences, which is a bit of a mouthful until you realize it's got a really convenient acronym of PINES. Uh, <laughs> playable interactive narrative experiences. There's this kind of sense that maybe trying to look at stories as inspiration for games, looking at the kind of the diversity of human experience could be the inspiration for games. I think that's a way of expanding in the future. I think that's a way of telling stories from more communities and getting more things in there to inspire gameplay, but starting from the stories of people. So starting with this foundation narrative experience, it doesn't rebuild the wall of fun. It kind of rebuilds this wall of pines. You see what I did with the background there. Uh, it's, it's, it's that sense of, of, of perhaps this playable interactive narrative experience thing is a different way of making games that doesn't re rely on constant mechanical in innovation. And I think this might be something we see more of in the future because mechanical innovation is really tough. And we, I think we are running out a little bit. The interesting thing about this is that we kind of have two different, well, th two different kind of values here, but a similar curve. So if you do complexity and time, well, and we do kind of this, if you do unique mechanics in terms of mechanical complexity over time, we kind of go, well, you get your first mechanic or maybe the first fight. Then you maybe get a mini boss and perhaps a new mechanic to try and beat the mini boss. And at the end, you kind of get the, the main boss. And this is kind of a typical structure for a level, a typical structure for a game. And it gets a little bit harder, a little bit more complicated, then you get good at it, and then it gets a little bit more complicated, and then you get good at it again, and it goes, and then it gets really complicated, and then the game finishes. Fairly typical. If we do this as emotional complexity, you actually find a similar thing. This is how we tell stories. This is a story structure. You have what's called the inciting incident at the beginning, and then people are trying to cope with that first problem that came up. And then usually trying to fix it, they actually make it worse, which creates the low midpoint, a high, a high emotional complexity. And they feel like they, know, they don't know where they're going to go. But then they kind of get teamed together, and they have a montage, and, and they all work out their problems. And they're going to have a united assault, which might be the death of them. But they have, then they go, the black moment, oh my god, it's not going to work. We're not going to pull it off. We're all going to die. And then they succeed, and the game and the story finishes. And that's how stories work. So we see this kind of similar kind of tension arc, similar complexity arc when we do these things. We could try and kind of describe these as perhaps this is emotional and this is mechanical. We could say that this is kind of talking about difficulty and this is talking about emotions. I don't think those things correlate very well. I don't think a harder game is a more emotional game. I think difficulty and emotions should be separated in terms of gameplay. I don't think that, I mean, yes, you might feel more tension, but that's you feeling tension rather than the story having tension in it. Um, and I think, they, I think these things, well, they, they, it might be the same, they might be related, but it's a bit of a fuzzy relationship there. I think we've got to be careful about saying, oh yeah, the player's going to feel really invested because this is the hardest boss they've ever fought. No, they're just going to go, oh, my thumbs hurt. Yeah, you've got to be careful of this kind of stuff, I think. So I'm going to spend the rest of this talk giving a very practical example of the stuff I've just been talking about so you can see how this is grounded and how this drives development from a narrative perspective. Let's just check in my times, okay. Um, so the game is called Fragments of Him. This came out on PlayStation last summer-ish. Uh, and it came out on Xbox the year before. And it was out on Steam as well, if you want to get it there. Uh, it was made by myself as a narrative designer and a game designer. Uh, Sassy Bot, which is Tino and Elwyn, and it had some awesome interns working with us. Sassy Bot are a small games dev studio down in Breda. Uh, they're awesome. They're making another game at the moment, which I can't tell you about. We have a lot of secrets in this industry. So uh, Fragments of Him is explored in the first person. You click highlighted objects, and the story proceeds. And this is essentially what happens. So you can just about make out, here's a window. The window is slightly highlighted in blue. I'm sorry for the, well, the, the con contrast on the, on the thing here. So you look at the, uh, oh, it's jerking a bit. You look at the window, oh, it's red, it's too far away. Yellow, you can click it, OK. I need to take the time to look at what's right in front of me. Wow, this computer doesn't like being hot. Character appears, says a line, walks off, disappears as they go. Believe me, the frame rate is a lot better when you play it on a proper computer. <laughs> so that's it. 
you walk around, you find highlighted things, you click on them, a bit of character happens, a bit of storytelling happens, and you walk on. And as you walk through, you hear these people's lives, you go on this journey with them. Fragments of Him is a story about uh, a young man who dies in an accident and how his friends and family come to terms with the loss. Um, it is the most personal thing I've ever written. This is not quite autobiographical, thankfully, uh, but there's a lot of me in there. So it started with a different foundation, and it really pushed us to create a very different type of play. What is the play here? It's actually emotional complexity rather than mechanical complexity. So a lot of games are, are played in the first person, where you are basically a floating eyeball. In, in Bioshock, you have no body beneath you. You are a floating eyeball. Some games, if you look down, you've got a body beneath you. In Aliens vs. Predator, we did that. But essentially, you're still basically looking through the eyes of the character. It's a first person perspective. In a lot of other games, you're a third person perspective. Uncharted, God of War, uh, Gears of War, probably other things of war. Um, you, you have a third person character here and you, you steer them around the world and you can make them run off cliffs, and you can make them shoot people in the face and you make them drown in the ocean if you want to. You can do lots of stuff with them. Our, character, our game is more like second person perspective, which is a bit weird. So what do we actually mean when I say second person perspective? So imagine there's a cup of tea as we... <laughs> no. No, no. Uh, <laughs> fucking Windows, it's even turned off the wireless and it's still trying to do that, I don't know. Uh, okay, um, so as you saw, when you play this game, there are highlighted objects in here. Uh, I, I'm so glad it didn't try to start updating then, you sat here for half an hour. Um, highlighted objects, you point at the highlighted object, you click on it, the character appears and interacts with it. You are not controlling that character. You are choosing what they're going to do next based on the highlighted things in the world. Now, I can control what is highlighted in the world. I will never click I go, oh, here's a beautiful cliff. I'm going to allow you to click off the side of the cliff, and then they can go and jump in the water. Because why would the character do that? But in first-person games, you can do that. In third-person games, you can do that. Why would Drake go and voluntarily throw himself off a cliff? You can make him do it in Uncharted. You can make him jump to his death as many times as you like. Drake would never do that. You're breaking character. And if your narrative experience comes first, then keeping that character comes first. So it's a way of kind of controlling that. It's also a way of taking away the pressure to perform. So it allows the character exploration, but all character actions remain consistent with their motivations. It stops the player from being forced to perform these things well. All you need to do is walk. You can take your time. There's no difficulty. This is aimed to be very open and very accessible. We also made the controls so you can play with just, if you can move a mouse and use one finger, then you can play this game. This is the first game my parents have ever finished. Because what we found was actually people would do, the, when we did w WASD and mouse, what people would do is they'd go, turn, turn, turn. Right, walk forwards, walk forwards. Okay, turn, turn, turn. Uh, but when we just made that you could walk forwards with the left button, they just kind of go, walk forward, look at thing, click on thing, walk forwards, click on thing, and suddenly everybody could play it. And that's nice. Suddenly everybody can play it. If you can use a mouse and click, which most, most people can. So it allows player exploration and all the character actions, because there is this distinction now between what the player does and where they walk and where they explore and what the character does. The character always does stuff that is pre-authored. The player can do whatever they like, but the player is not a character in the game. So it's a bit like walking along beside an actor. The actor's performing Henry V's soliloquy or whatever from Shakespeare, and they're, they're fully into it. And all you have to do is kind of go, this is awesome. Look at that performance. That's great fun. The pressure is off the player. So it removes that pressure from the, from the players. So this is starting with our unique narrative uh, experience. What was the experience we were going for here? Well, we wanted a real-world setting and theme because that's fairly unusual. We wanted to have everyday events in there, things that people would do. Have a shower, make a cup of tea, go around to see your grandma. These are the kind of things that they wanted, we wanted in there. We didn't want sci-fi, we didn't want supernatural horror, we didn't want serial killers in there. When video games are about the real world, there's usually a serial killer in it. I, as far as I know, have never met a serial killer. I'm hoping that's not part of my real world life. As far as I know, some of my colleagues. Mm. Uh, uh, the theme of the game was love's power to change and heal. That's something that we, uh, we think of as, as, a, as a nice motive. And that's a story that is classic. That's something that appeals to a lot of people. We have a portmanteau story, which is an unusual phrase. 
Portmanteau is, uh, in our case, it's four people with their own emotional journey. Portmanteau is, a, is, a, is a literally a, a file that you hold many other files in. And altogether, they are a single portmanteau file. Portmanteau storytelling is multiple stories that all add up to one whole experience. Each has a believable and inter internally coherent story. Each has their own narrative arc, their own complete cycle they go through. And all the stories combine to make a single whole game. We had a preset art, start and end. We wanted to make a mostly linear game. We wanted to have variation within the order of events, but not within the emotional journey. Uh, and the emotional journey takes precedence over chronology. So you're jumping from 2006 back to 1985 through to 1997 all the time, but the emotional journey is consistent no matter how you do this. It's not time travel, these are just memories, by the way. So no, no sci-fi. So um, in essence, the game is a real-world story of love with four lead roles and a highly structured, non-chronological converging branches plot structure. Simple as that, of course, yeah. Uh, which essentially means that you start here with Will, the character's name is Will. Now, depending on one of the choices, the player doesn't know they're making a choice, but they make a choice, they do a thing. You can either see Sarah's story next or Mary's story next. Then you get a common emotional tone here, no matter which one you saw first. And then you see the one that you didn't see before. You get a common emotional tone here, and then you get to the same events here. So there is a little bit of branching within it, but essentially the emotional journey remains the consistent. And then you get Harry's story at the end. So those are the four characters we have. This is pretty unique in terms of the story world, the, the, the story, the characters, and the plot uh, for video games. You know, films have done this many times, these kind of stories. Drama is a major thing in video games. Drama, oh, sorry, is in film or television. Drama is not a major genre in video games at the moment. So it's still fairly unique there. So next brick that we want to build on is our visuals. So with the tone of the game is somber with, with some light and, uh, light and hope in there. So unfortunately, the, the, like I say, the contrast on the projector isn't great with the sunlight here. But you can see we kind of went for that somber tone with low, ho hope and light in there. Again, with some of the visuals, it's somber, but there's some hope and light kind of infusing the scenes. We had a near grayscale palette, and this was chosen to enhance this tone. Um, and yet, we wanted this world to feel real, even though it's mostly black and white. We wanted to build reality in there. So we filled this world with as much detail as possible. Uh, oh, you really can't see that. This is a bookshelf, and lots of the books have individual names on it. That's Idoru by William Gibson. Uh, that one there is Anno Dracula. Uh, just above it is Treasure Island. Next to that, there's the Dice Man. Next to that, we've got ooh, oh, we've got the Hogfather by Terry Pratchett at the top there. These are the books which reflect the taste of, the, of Will, who happens to live in this location. If you go to a different location, to a different person's room, they will have different taste in books. Every book is chosen to fit the character, the time period, the tastes, their friends. So if people have been friends for a while, some of the books from this person's bookshelf might suddenly start turning up on this person's bookshelf. There's a lot of detail put into this. These are photos from the trips that they've gone on to, together, that Will and Harry went on together. Oh, Will and Harry are dating in the main part of the story. Uh, this is a carriage clock, which is very typical from the 1980s, and it turns up on the shelf in a 1980s scene, in no other scenes, because it doesn't fit those. So we really carefully chose those props to build the whole thing. We intuitively understand these symbols. As people, we, we recognize these things from the real world. We understand these, and if we might recognize a couple of the books and go, oh, yeah, yeah, I know that kind of book. And we then learn who the people are intuitively. In terms of audio, in terms of the script here, well, we, it was written over two years. This was quite an extensive, long writing period. Each character has a fully developed backstory. Uh, we had over 250 auditions for the actors. There were 50 shortlisted. And the final cast of actors actually came from, from games, but also from TV, from film, and from theater. Because sometimes, to get the best range, maybe sometimes theater actors are going to be best. Always going to game actors might not always be the best solution. In terms of sound effects, we wanted to go for minimal and unintrusive. We, they need to be there. They're part of the player information, but we didn't want to have like, -li 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 -ding, ding you finish the scene. That would be a bit weird. So we try to focus on the positive and negative feedback here. What I mean by positive feedback is like you pick up the bottle. The bottle does a thing. You click to the side of the bottle, and the world kind of goes, Dum, or something. You, you get feedback when you don't do it right. This is something that's missing from a lot of game design. If you're a games designer, please remember the negative feedback. Please remember to tell your player when they've tried something, but it wasn't correct. Negative feedback is really important. Also, web designers. Is anybody here a web designer? 
Yeah, include negative feedback in your web designs, please. So when people try the wrong thing, let them know, I know you tried it, it just wasn't correct. It makes the user experience much better. In terms of the music, we, again, kept it fairly minimal. We were inspired by classical music, Chopin particularly. Um, and we had a combination of mostly outside work from Pit Stop Productions, and we had some in-house uh, audio. So we really tried to get some great actors, a great script, some sound effects that worked, and some music in there. Now, as I said before, Foley, the sound effects in your games are very, very important. So if we take the example of a lift door, imagine you walk up to a lift door and the doors slide open. Well, that needs a sound effect, doesn't it? So one of the sound effects we could have is like, creak, and go, oh, shit, nobody's, nobody's oiled this. This place might be creepy. It's badly maintained. There's something going on in this place. Or it could be clatter. Go, OK, well, it's made of really cheap metal. You know, they, it might look shiny, but you know, people haven't really invested in this. Perhaps they're a, bit, a little bit cheap. Perhaps they're not the best person to work with. But they're OK. They're trying hard. All right. Perhaps it goes rumble. You go, ooh, someone spent some money around here, haven't they? OK, this is the place that's got money. Whether that money's come from a good place or not, maybe they're a drug dealer. Maybe they're a successful business person. We don't know. But we know there's money here. We get a feeling of that just from how the lift doors have sounded. It could be shh. You go, ooh, it's a bit sci-fi around here. Star Trek. Uh, and that's just from one sound effect. We can get so much from one sound effect on a door. That's really powerful. That's a really powerful way of telling a story and building a world. So think about your Foley very carefully when you're trying to build that narrative experience. We iterated the individual sounds quite often. So actually, lift doors were one of the ones that we did do quite a few times. We had an example where uh, it was a nighttime scene. And there was like a little bit of wind, some cicadas chirruping away, except it's the south of England, and we don't really have cicadas. Uh, so we had like nighttime bird song that we found instead, because cicada sounds more like a Mexican desert than it did sort of Surrey <laughs> in the UK. So, so trying to get those right nighttime sounds to build in that detail was really important to us. Also, the ambient noise, the traffic, the bird song. Make sure these things all fit and support the experience you're going for. So for the idea with the audio, we really worked with this idea that real, believable sounds significantly help build the narrative setting. And I, I think it paid off. I think that attention to detail really makes it feel right. And of course, that, that fourth brick, excellence. That's an important one. So we try to do this as well as we can. So. We got the experienced writer and narrative designer on the project for over two years. That's me. I've been making games since about 2000 or something. Um, we had the experienced audio team on board, man, uh, great actors, many iterations on the sounds. And we did careful scoping on the visuals. Now, this is a bit of a thing, because scoping means to, kind of to make it smaller and make it manageable by your team. So we had four characters. Can just about make them out on the projector there. We've got Harry, Will, Sarah, and Mary. Uh, we've got four characters. We've got 14 variations of their clothing. OK, these are customized to the time zone. Uh, you can see Sarah there in her beanie hat and jeans uh, in one of her 1990s things. Mary keeps the same outfit most of the time, like my grandmother did. Uh, you know, there's different kind of things here for each of the characters. And we had around 16 different lo detailed locations, each of which was customized by the year, the character. Uh, and we had hundreds of poses and animations. I think it was over 250 poses and animations in this game. Now, that sounds fine, except that we had one art director plus interns. That's a lot of work for basically one person. There he is, Tino. Oh, he looks a lot more tired now he finished this game. I worked him very hard. God bless him. Um, so how the hell do we make that work? How do we make those two things work together? Well, we set priorities. And our priorities were real world, four characters, emotional drama. That's our narrative, that's our unique narrative proposition here. So let's make this happen. OK, well, obviously one of the questions is, like, is photorealism necessary for emotional storytelling? Does it have to look absolutely real? Ah, that's emotional. This is one of, yeah, round of applause. Uh, this, is, this is a very emotional thing. Uh, people feel this in their gut. They feel the emotions in that. It's not photorealistic. People who played Final Fantasy so oh, well, I see a face back there going, oh, yeah. People felt this. People, they might have felt this because they're like, oh, my God, she was carrying my favorite weapon. Is it lost now? But still, um, 
they, they felt this emotionally. This was an emotional punch. And I, for, for me, Ico was a huge inspiration here. These are low poly models with very simple textures, but they move beautifully. It's a really lovely emotional game. So I think Ico, Ico proved that believable animation and good costume design can bring low detail models to life. So that's good. So is photorealism necessary for emotional storytelling? No, it's not. Uh, so we went for that ourselves. You may notice that these characters, probably a bit hard to see, these characters' faces are kind of blank-ish. They are individual, but they are slightly blank. Um, so we use, chose to use these semi-blank faces to prioritize the detail that's in the world here. We, we kind of really had a choice. We either could do fa facial animation or a detailed world. These are both going to take a lot of time, so you have to make a smart choice between the two of them. We had very, very limited time to do it. So, well, we, with facial animation, it tends to be all or nothing. If you're going to have a character just sitting there going, bah, 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 as it talks, it's not going to convey the emotion. Whereas if you've got a beautifully detailed world, you can understand it. If they move OK, if they're f sort of fairly flexible in what they do, then perhaps it still makes sense. So we chose that we're just going to have nothing. We chose to have nothing, and we hoped that people would use their imagination. We hoped the imagination of people was re were really going to help us bring this world to light, uh, really sort of fill it up there for us. And the funny thing was that some testers, they swore they could see animation. They swore the faces were moving. They said, oh, I, I could see them frowning. I could see their face. And I was like, nope. There are, there's no rigging. There's no animation. There's no bones. There's no chance any of those faces of those characters moved. But they still swear they saw it. You know you're doing something right when that kind of stuff happens. This is, this is awesome. So we still needed hundreds of animations and poses, because these bodies are still going to be moving around. They're still going to be opening doors, and cups of tea, getting in cars, driving. We still needed to do all that stuff. So we hired the Xsense motion capture suit for my university. So there's Tino in the suit. He was also our main actor for the motion capture. Um, so this gave us a fairly shortish route to creating hundreds of poses and animations here. Now, emotions, I think, are intuitive. We, we, we just feel them or we don't. And your visual design must support that. The choices you make and how the whole thing looks, they are going to be supporting every choice you make here. So um, to put this whole thing all together, we actually planned the whole thing in Microsoft Excel, which seems like a really lo-fi tool to do this. But we needed something which could put together all the data we wanted. So this is a, this is a genuine example of the, uh, of the game design document. It's not a big Word document. It's not pages and pages and pages. It's just this. And this contains all the information we, well, a lot of the information we needed. So we had the basic scene details here. So in this case, it's uh, saying it's a student bar in 1997 at the end of August, and Sarah is the one who's going to be our main character here. Um, we had the high level plot and detail description of like what's happening, what's going on, and where we are in the plot structure. We had the detail of the activity and scene, what's overall going to happen in the scene as we go through it. And then we have a trigger event. So uh, this, this will be the start of the level, or you see the person visible at the window, you go downstairs, and what's clicked, what does the player do to trigger that next part of the animation, what next part of the story? And then we have one line of dialogue selecting to be played. So each time the player hears, plays this game, they'll get slightly different selections, slightly different combinations of lines, more like they've gone to the theater on a different night. And you know, the performers, the cast will still be the same, but really, in the end, they're going to hear something slightly different each time because it's supposed to feel natural, it's supposed to feel emotional, and you don't have exactly the same emotion every time you tell a story. Same kind of story, but slightly different tone each time. Now, one of the interesting things, well, there's kind of where the technical stuff comes in, is that Unity didn't actually naturally support that. Randomization of dialogue options was not built into Unity at this time, so a custom tool was required to be developed. That's where people like Elwin come in. Hello, Elwin. Elwin worked bloody hard to make all the tools work and make sure that we could put the whole game together. Um, that was his role in this, and he did a bloody good job of it. So we had this first-person interaction, the walking around, the seeing the highlighted objects, the things to click on. We had that consistent throughout. And we had uh, the world's response was changing. So you might click on a, a cup of tea, and the person will drink a cup of tea. The next time you'll be clicking on a door, the door's going to open. You do lots of different things. You can drive a car. You can go to walk around a space. Um, and so we've kind of got this sort of very consistent mechanical thing, but a variation in terms of the emotional Im impact. Mechanics stay the same all the time. Emotions change, except for when you get to Harry's bit. 
Now, if you remember that branching structure I showed you earlier, Harry is right at the very end. Harry's about the last 25 minutes of the game, 20 minutes of the game. Here's that final part there. Now, what's, what goes on with Harry? Well, everyone else, else gets variety. Everyone else gets the story that they're telling, the story they remember. But Harry is stuck deep in grief. The love of his life has just died suddenly. And what do you do with that? Um, if, if any of you have ever felt this, this is a terrible feeling. Uh, sadly, um, if you live long enough, this is going to happen to you. At some point, you're going to wake up and a person you love won't be there. The next day, they might be a colleague, they might be a friend, they might be a lover. This is going to happen to you at some point in your life. This sucks, but this is reality. And this is the reality that Harry's going through at this time. And he is stuck deep into this. So whenever you click in this, the interaction remains the same, but the world's repetition, repetitive response reflects Harry's internal state. Whenever you click in Harry's part, you click on an object and the object disappears. It could be he's ignoring it. It could be it reminds him too much of where they were. It reminds him of that love. He could be just trying to shelter himself away. It could be that he just doesn't want to see that thing. It could be he's throwing it out or giving it to a charity shop, but he just doesn't want to have those things in his life anymore because it hurts too much to remember. That's where Harry is in his life. And it just is the same thing again and again and again. And all the systems that we had for this interaction, this basic walk around, click on stuff, were kept the same throughout. And they basically were the same from the very beginning of the design. This is the early design document. Uh, Rescue all, it's a small dot in the center. It became a circle, not much change there. We had white, which was no interaction available. Blue for interaction attempted, where no interaction was available. Negative feedback, don't forget it. Uh, we had yellow, which is a valid interaction is there. We had deep red, a valid interaction available, but it's too distant. And we had orange for the interaction is currently not possible. Something else is happening. Uh, and we kept this consistent throughout the whole game and throughout the whole of development. Successful and unsuccessful interactions backed up with appropriate audio. Don't forget audio in your game design, please. We added one extra animation state and one, and one extra state here, like signaling when the click. Basically, this stayed the same. The core did not change. All pretty standard. You know, if you've played a game, any first person game, you've walked around, clicked on stuff, this is pretty standard. You're familiar with this kind of feeling. All pretty simple, all very usable, all very approachable. There is something missing from that, though. There's something missing. You know, we've, we use a lot of red, we use a lot of yellow. We're missing the other one there. And we, we're used to there being a green. Where's that, where's that green gone? Huh. We've even got a white and a blue occasionally. Mostly it's these. So this is our base. This is the thing that we built everything based on. Every choice we made was based on our unique narrative experience. Every single thing we did comes from this stem. And grief, losing a loved one in this case, it feels like never being able to move on. It feels like never being able to have that green light in your life. This is your life. This is where you are until you can begin to accept it. But this is a story about a person moving through grief. As I said, this is about the loss of a loved one and how his friends and family come to terms with that loss, how they come to terms with it, moving through grief, finding the other side, moving on to acceptance. That's what this story is about that love and acceptance and love conquering through time. And the moment he emerges from grief, that yellow disappears from the game and you get green. A tiny little choice, a tiny little thing. It's an extra little thing you can do. The red has been yellow the whole time, changes to green, and Harry is ready to go on with his life. Even with minimal HUD and with only one interaction in your whole game, you can find ways to support that narrative experience. This is what I mean when you say, this is going to drive everything. This is the foundation. This is what's going to help me make all of my choices. That unique narrative experience can bleed into everything you create in your game. So narrative design is much more than script writing. It's this kind of thing, too. This is a storytelling tool right here. I think starting with this different foundation led to a very highly divergent forms of, of digital entertainment. There's lots of different things we can do with this. This is one game, one experiment, one avenue that we could go down. Some people might go down this, this avenue. Some people go in completely different directions. Some people might go, okay, what happens if I put the audio brick at the bottom here? How do I build up from there to create a unique audio experience? And I think some people have done that, like res, like, um, uh, the rock, rock band games. Uh, they've put audio as the key, making you feel music. I think these are, these are great things. 
so what are your priorities? When you're creating an experience, when you're creating a, a website to tell a story when you're for a brand, or when you're creating a game, or you're making a film, or you're working in your code, what is the story, what's the priority for you? What is the experience you want your users to have in the end? Because you are all creating stuff for end users. Whether that's someone in your company or somebody in the public, you're creating stuff for end users. Think about your own priorities here. Putting narrative first meant for us swapping mechanical for emotional complexity. We had this focus on simplicity and player interactions. We had freedom for non, for non chronological plot and portmanteau storytelling. If you're playing most games, you have one character you follow from beginning to end. We freed ourselves from that, explored that to create a more powerful emotional experience. We had scoping through relying on the player's imagination. That was an important thing to us. With a small team, it's sometimes important to make those priority choices. And using interaction, variation, and repetition, and HUD design as storytelling tools, I think that was a really a big benefit we had from this. We had to really think creatively about how that narrative experience bled into every single part of the choices we made. The interactions in our game were always for the theme and not for the difficulty. So I hope this talk has inspired you to think about kind of how you convey narrative experience in your games or in the products or in the software or in the work that you do. I hope if you're interested in going to the games industry, this will help you think about the things that we can do with it in a different way. And if you just like playing games, hopefully you'll look at them slightly differently in a more informed way in the future. That would be nice too. Cool. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. Thank you. Cool. I, I did promise you that if you want to take any photos or anything like that, we've got all these kind of bits. I'm sorry about the lack of uh, sort of contrast here, but hopefully it's clear enough. I don't know, organizers, do these videos go online at some point or uh, anything? We have no idea. Okay. Right, let's get up. Everyone got that? Photo, photo, yeah, all done, good. Yep. Somebody behind you. There we are. Got that one? That is a completely different talk. If you want me to, to uh, give that, then you can hire me and come to your company to tell it, to give it. Yeah. Available call, consultation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're good. And let's do that one if you fancy that one. And we get that one if you fancy it. And final one is that one. There we go. <laughs> the sun has been gradually draining the color out of the projector for this whole thing here, hasn't it? <laughs> well, we've got one more photo at the back there. And, and I think we are all good. Right. Thank you all once again for listening. Uh, if you've got any questions, uh, do we have time for questions, organizer person, or? We don't have time for questions, in which case just come up and see me in a moment if you want. Well, this is the last talk, so if anyone does have any questions, do you want to ask a question? If not, you're welcome to come see me. Have a question, yes. Uh-huh. Ooh, uh, actually, audio tends to be the cheapest part of development. If you, there, there, are, there are cheap ways of getting to it. Um, I would recommend sacrificing your visuals after, before your audio, personally. Um, you can scale down uh, visual fidelity and cuts. You can go for a lower, po lower poly, poly style. Well, it still takes time. It still takes expertise, don't get me wrong. But you can actually create some very compelling visuals with particle effects, with lighting. Um, audio, I personally find such an important part of the experience that I would be very cautious about cutting it. Um, you can find people who can compose for lower budgets. Sometimes you get good experiences, sometimes you don't. It's like going on Fiverr. You know, sometimes you'll get a great person for five dollars, sometimes you won't. Um, Fiverr can be a good way of finding a good team for a reasonable price. If you can give them so, okay, for five 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 dollars, do me thirty seconds of music. Could you give it a try? You can see how good people are, and then you actually hire them for their proper price. So um, 
Uh, and there's also the sound libraries you can buy fairly cheaply, uh, which can give you a lot of good audio quality. And if they might be freely distributed, or they might be 30 euros on a like a Unity store or on the Unreal store. And of course, other people have that have those too. So release your game faster. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, but there are there are ways around it if you want to create it. I'd avoid, I'd avoid being cheap as much as possible. But uh, yes, if you have to cut somewhere, I would try to avoid doing it in the audio. Also, you can just be smart with how you do it. For example, footsteps. You can use slight pitch shifting uh, per footsteps. So you can actually get a bigger sound database uh, that sounds varied without having a vast database in your library. And that also creates, uh, that saves on kind of um, streaming. Uh, you don't want to stream in 50 different footstep sounds when you can just do two and pitch shift slightly. There are ways of getting around this and, and discounting it slightly. If you've got a good audio developer, they'll be able to find you lots of shortcuts. But that's the difference between getting good people and people who don't know what they're doing. The good people know cheap ways of doing it, too. Um, but yeah, work with people, get some samples, and find a good way of doing it. Cool. Any other questions? No? In which case, thank you all for coming on this very hot and sunny day. Thank you, everybody.